What's up, people? James with Sailings and Garo. And it appears that there's a plethora of live streams going on, so I thought maybe I'd join. Uh, actually, I've been working on this one for quite a while. I've been uh, listing a bunch of lessons learned from our shipwreck, and I want to go over a bunch of stuff. I don't think I actually put the whole list on YouTube, but I put it on Patreon and Facebook. Um, so some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today are drag devices, uh, how to stay calm under pressure, um, how to set your boat up for heavy weather, what heavy, some heavy weather tactics are, and basically just seamanship in heavy weather. Um, and what happened with me, and we'll go, we'll touch on uh, why I think the boat broke and what uh, I could have done to either prevent it or, uh, you know, in hindsight, uh, mitigate that uh, more anyway. So, Get ready for some cool stuff. I don't have an intro for you today. I don't have any kind of uh, really cool stuff, uh, like, a, like a theme song. I should write a theme song though. But um, I do have some really cool visual aids and we're gonna get really in depth on uh, most of the drag devices because I think that those, the one that I had almost killed us. So uh, just a, a really quickly a word about Kimmy. She is in Mexico right now. She went down there to visit her sister that's on her leap year and she got stuck there. So um, the embassy sent her, uh, uh, sent her some tickets and she's heading back to, to Berlin uh, tomorrow. So she's not gonna be here right now and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to reconnect in the future. But uh, yeah, for now I'm kind of stuck. Uh, I'm on my buddy's boat. This is Wild Thing. This is uh, Voyage 47, I think. It's like a 50 footer. And we are redoing his engine. This is his engine here. That's actually a Yanmar engine, but he wanted to paint it white so he could see any kind of deficiencies. So that's kind of neat, yeah? And I'm in Lahaina Harbor in Hawaii. And there's the break wall, there's the waves. There's surfers out there, and there's surfers out there, and there's some boats out there. All right, so that's where I'm at. And that's where I'm uh, coronavirus homesteading with a friend on a boat. We just went spearfishing. Oh, Dude, last two days, I've had two sharks bite my spear. Uh, I've never had that happen before, and they're getting super aggressive here. And I'm thinking that why, the reason is is because the charter boats aren't going out and the fishing boats aren't going out, and they're not feeding the sharks anymore. So, um, yeah, I almost got eaten by a shark this morning. So that's weird. Shark this morning. So that's weird. So. This morning. So that's weird. Um, so this morning. Oh, you know what I need to do is turn the sound off to this. I'm sorry. Oh, you know I'm not seeing that there's anybody on here, but uh, maybe it's just not updating. Let me just reload the page real quick. And we'll see what happens. Okay, cool, now I got you. All right, let's see. Hayden, what's up? Samantha Carriage, hey, what's up? Sailing Vessel Serenity, uh, Elena Smith, John Norton, um, Hayden, Stan Meckham, what's up, buddy? One of my patrons. Sail Aurea, also a patron and also a really cool guy. Uh, how's the refit going, man? Um, Stan, Rick, Screwball from Penn's Woods, USA. What state is Penn's Woods in? Because Woods is definitely not a state. Two Eyes, what's up? Uh, <laughs> Yana says, I'm drinking rum. That's awesome. I've actually quit drinking. Um, uh, after the boat got wrecked I feel I felt like I needed to kind of center myself and I went to a Vipassana um, that's a 10-day meditation uh, course that's a, it's a silent one so you take a vow of silence for 10 days you don't even look anybody in the eye and you meditate for 10 hours a day it was hands down one of the most beneficial things I've ever done in my life and one of the most painful things I've ever gone through voluntarily uh, it's called Vipassana. It's a 2,500 year old meditation technique taught by Buddha. And it's really, it works. It works for a lot of people. It works for me. I meditate every day and I'm a little more chill now. Or at least I try to be. Uh, Eric Pearson, what's up homies? What's up dude? Peter Emerton from the UK, what's up? Um, Gabriel Marquez, donde esta tu chica? Yeah, I, I went over that, she's in Mexico and uh, she is flying to Berlin. So uh, she won't be joining us today. But I'm here, 
and I'm going to be talking to you about some cool stuff. If you guys want to nerd out with me for a little while, great. Um, I'm going to be going over some heavy weather techniques, some para, para anchor stuff. I'm going to show you my favorite, uh, what, what I'm going to have on my next boat. Uh, just to touch on the boat really quick, it is in the in process, but obviously I can't even go look at one. So uh, we're ta I'm talking to brokers and uh, making moves, but until I can go see the boat, I'm not going to buy a boat sight unseen for that much money. So um, it looks like it's it's definitely going to be another daggerboard catamaran. We'll talk about that and about monohulls versus cats. This is going to be more of a catamaran specific drag device talk. Um, and I will let I will let Kimmy know that all of you miss her. Um, let's see. Julian says greetings, everyone from Saint Martin. Uh, James says wonderful to grow. Yes, sir, it is. Uh, Sail Aurea says glad to, glad to hear about quitting drinking. Al alcohol poisons the body. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do miss rum a little. <laughs> um, Dan Daniel says when you d get to to your new boat, have you gone? Have you got one now, or did you reach your goal money-wise? Uh, we did reach the goal for the for the down payment on the boat. So, uh, thank you for everybody that backed us. It's going to be amazing. We're going to have a. I can't wait to share. There's going to be some really awesome things going on. I don't want to go into it right now, just because it's going to ruin the surprise, and I kind of wanted to be surprised. But you guys are going to flip. Uh, okay. So, AGC eight eight twelve. Hello from Dallas and uh, Estrella del Mar, silence is good. Oh, Mike Phillips, Shaka man. Um, so, let's see, what are we doing now? We are about, uh, we're still about six months behind in the episodes. Uh, I am going to start putting those out quickly because I want to catch up and get out some new material of me uh, looking for the boat and show you guys what I'm doing and how I'm looking for it and like more real-time stuff and then when the boat does close I want to be like boom here world this is the new thing uh, and this is the new season and this is like where we're going now so it's very confusing that everybody's uh, you know asking me questions I'm not watching myself I like to use my hands I should stop doing that but anyway let's get into this thing if you guys have any questions listen this is important if you guys have any questions, please write them in all caps. That way I can just scroll through really, really quick, like legitimate questions about this. Write them in caps and we'll get through them at, at the end. Okay, I've got a freaking, I'm, I'm all pro here. I've got my outline and everything. Okay, so here are the lessons learned that I uh, want to uh, talk to you guys about. Uh, I went through, uh, we, I'm sorry, me and Kim, went through a, a horrific experience on a boat. Uh, if you guys don't know, if you're just tuning in, we our, our catamaran, uh, the, the starboard hull, broke off of the boat and it was only being held on by the deck. All the stringers and, and uh, main beams broke and the bridge deck joint also broke. So it was literally, the, the, it was just hold, holding on by the deck and it was cracking more and more. And the deck was cracked through and we were taking waves over the side and they were getting into the boat and we were taking on water. and, and I figured it was just a matter of time before we took a wave into, in between the bridge deck and the hull. It filled the hull and it just flipped the boat. That's would have, what would have happened. So uh, it was Kim's idea that we tie the boat together. So I got in the, in the water with a piece of Dyneema. Uh, well, actually, first we used just rope and it broke. But I swam under the boat, gave it to Kim. She put it in a winch. We got the boat tied together. Everything was good. So. Uh, now, it's about a month and a half, two months later now, jeez, it's two months later, and we um, have learned a lot. And I want to impart to you, I, I touched on it on the live stream where we uh, announced that the boat was wrecked, but we didn't really go into it in, in very much depth. So first things first, uh, remaining calm and taking action under pressure. So you can imagine when I went down and saw the... Uh, the boat was ripped in half and all the stringers were broken and there was sawdust everywhere and there was water coming in. I looked kind of like this kid. And, uh, you know, at first, I think it's the body's natural reaction to kind of freeze and be like, holy schmoly, this is great, not good. Uh, and really, uh, what you should be doing instead of reacting like this guy and just freaking out and running around in circles, uh, which, which is the way some people, some people would take that. Um, you should really just stop and take a minute 
and uh, tell yourself, okay, what do I need to do to remedy this situation? Do I need to get off the boat? Do I need to get the life raft out? Do I need to uh, call the Coast Guard? Or do I need to take actions to keep the boat from flipping and sinking, which was ultimately what we did. Um, we didn't call the Coast Guard right away. We didn't pop the EPIRB right away. It was just a matter of, look, this is our home, this is our boat, we need to save it. This is the only thing we can do to save it. So then we had to decide whether we're gonna get in the water. It was a really high sea state. The, the boat was moving real bad. Uh, we were under sail, so we, the first thing we did was Kim took the sails down while I got in the water, and then uh, I passed her up, a, up a, a line. So the next thing we did right after we got the boat secured and tied together uh, was I have a sea anchor. Now, I'm gonna explain to you guys the difference between a sea anchor and a drogue, okay? A drogue is something that you, you <clears throat> uh, trail off the back of your boat that slows you down, uh, be it a uh, Jordan series drogue with a bunch of cones, uh, be it a sea claw drogue, a uh, gale rider drogue, um, I'll go into what all these are, um, or just a tire. With a, with a piece of plywood nailed to a, a line. Uh, that's something that you throw off the end of the boat uh, a couple hundred feet back and you can adjust it with a winch, you usually put on a winch, and uh, it slows the boat down. Uh, very necessary on a cat. A lot of people, there, there's conflicting views on whether to use these drag devices. Uh, Skip Novak says that they're dangerous because there's a lot of loads, uh, but he's on a big monohull boat. I think on a catamaran, personally, I will never go to sea without a drogue and a, a parachute anchor again. And I had both and I was using both. I was actually had two drogues out when we wrecked. And right after that, uh, to finish the story, we put the sea anchor out. So I have 400 feet of line back in an aft lazarette. That's just a locker in the cockpit. That's what that's called. Um, inside that lazarette, I had coiled up 400 feet of line. A giant swivel, a big shackle, and all, all to a sea anchor. The problem was the sea anchor came with the boat and it was undersized and it was the wrong, I, I'm personally, I think, the wrong manufacturing. So uh, let's, let's just talk about what sea anchors are. This is a Paratech sea anchor. Uh, this is exactly the style that I had, but it was like a homemade one. Uh, what, what it does is it's stuck into this bag whoop, and it's stuffed all in there and then it's got a painter that goes from the bag to the anchor and then another painter with all of the webbing that comes up to a shackle. Problem with this kind of design that I think is um, just from experience is that the shackle can flip and then it gets tangled up inside all that webbing and then it's it's impossible to get out. I mean even if you sat there for an hour, which I did, uh, trying to unflip it and unscrew it up, and it, it's just, if it gets tangled, it's really, really bad news. And uh, we, had, we had practice with this sea anchor twice, and it, it, it worked fine both times, but this time it didn't work fine. And I'm, I'm attributing it to the sea state and the, uh, the amount of pressure that was going on to the sea anchor, I think was flipping it. I think it was collapsing and flipping it. In the morning, I was trying it again. I ended up um, pulling that whole 400 foot, foot line with a half collapsed sea anchor in four times. We did, uh, Kim and I, and trying to deal with what was going on because it was, you know, it was imperative that we keep our nose into the wind and waves. So the way a sea anchor works is you put it out from the bow with a bridle, uh, and you should use a bridle on a monohull or a catamaran, but definitely on a catamaran. And it keeps you, it's just like an anchor, it's just what, it's, what it is, it's, an, it's a sea anchor. That parachute keeps you nose in to the wind, and the wind, the wind makes the waves, so, so the waves are gonna be hitting you directly straight on, and even if they're big and breaking, you're gonna hit them through your bows and your boat will go through, and then just bounce up. And you'll take some over the boat, uh, but it's, it's definitely, definitely better than taking them on the side. Most boats, most sailboats, if just left alone, uh, they'll go beam on to the wind. So if the wind's coming here, they're, they're right perpendicular to it. On a catamaran, that's really bad because then you get, you get um, side action, underneath action, it's hitting the bridge deck, it's really uncomfortable, it's really hard on the boat, um, and yeah, you don't want that. Same thing with a monocle. I mean, you, you'll end up 
you know, monohull rig is like this, and you get hit by a big wave, and it it, it can knock you down. Um, so that's the Paratech anchor. This is the Cape Horn version of the Paratech anchor. It's just got a little um, thicker dacron on there, and uh, looks like some reinforced webbing. Um, it looks to me like that would be a little harder to uh, flip over and get um, tangle in itself. But this is the kind of sea anchor I'm going to have on my next boat. This is called a Fiorentino sea anchor. And if you can see there, it's got this uh, metal ring. So it's got a big fat metal ring and then four um, struts on that ring that go to a big shackle and then a thimble. And that's uh, pretty well made. Uh, when, you, when you get this type of sea anchor, you get it in a bag like this and you store, store the bag in a lazarette or in the back of your boat or you tie it to the stern pulpit or something but you get this thing ready to rock so this this sea anchor is what i'm going to have they're about eight hundred dollars uh and that's i think what the best version of uh, a sea anchor could be just from my experience i don't have a lot of experience but I've got enough where I've, I've held on to a sea anchor a few times um, in a storm. And particularly in this instance, this was really bad. It was, it was sustained 30, gusting to 40 for two days and big waves and uh, the broken boat and water ingressing on the boat. So it just made it that much more apparent like what the problems were. I needed this thing to work for my life. It ended up, uh, because the sea anchor didn't work, every time Every time the sea anchor would collapse, we'd go beam to the waves, and then the waves would come and like pull the boat apart, and it was causing the line to cut through the boat, for one, and it was breaking the lines. It happened twice that it snapped the lines that were holding the boat together. So I, I was exhausted and so tired and just uh, done, cold, uh, because of this damn sea anchor. So super, super big deal, super, super... Uh, I, I personally don't have any experience with this type, uh, this type, but um, I, I think just looking at it, it would be way better than the other uh, Paratech type anchor or any kind of homemade things. So uh, now let's talk about drogues because I was using a couple of drogues. Uh, maybe we'll just go into YouTube real quick and see. There's 600 people here. Wow, cool. Welcome, people. Um, Estrella del Mar says, did insurance cover the boat? No, I didn't have insurance for two reasons. One, it was a 35-year-old home-built boat out of Eric's Foam and nobody would insure me. And two, uh, the only insurance quota that I got that would insure me for our route, which was all over the place, was going to be $15,000 a year, uh, which was ridiculous, just ridiculous. That's uh, a quarter of the boat's worth per year. Insurance, even full coverage for any other cruising boat would be two to three percent. So it didn't make sense. Um, in retrospect, that would it would have saved me like 10 grand, I guess, but I couldn't afford it. I couldn't afford that. Uh, there was hardly anybody will give you a loan or insurance on a boat that's that old, that's made out of plywood, that's uh, home built, you know? Um, I'm, I won't buy another home built boat because of that, because uh, people, they respect a, a reputable yard for a reason. There's, you know, th there's no workarounds. There's no uh, uh, changing of the design plan. There's uh, professional indoor uh, equipment that, that will not make the fiberglass delaminate as easy. Uh, a lot of the time it's vacuum bagged in a factory and not vacuum bagged in a uh, uh, home built deal. It's just laid up. If you don't know that what that means, you can look it up. Look up vacuum bagging on Google. Um, <clears throat> Glenn Arineshkoff says, what are your plans for when you can move about again? Uh, my plan is to go visit um, Russ and Karen with OC Tenders. Uh, if you guys didn't know, we got an OC Tender given to us by, uh, by them. They're the owners. And they are awesome. We had one during the wreck. And I, I tell you what. It, it eased our minds to have an unsinkable dinghy. This thing is what it sounds like. It's unsinkable. Unsink it's made of complete composite. It's not an inflatable dinghy. It can't pop. And it's got a layer of uh, the same material they make PFDs out of around the entire boat. So, I mean, you can look, look it up, OC Tender Sink, and you'll see two grown men standing in a boat that's completely full of water and they're trying to sink it and they can't. 
So having the unsinkable dinghy, the OC tender was so freaking nice. Thank you, Karen and Russ, you saved us. I mean, I don't know what I would have done had, had we not had that. Uh, the boat technically doesn't sink either. It's made of foam. Most catamarans don't. But uh, not having a life raft, having that dinghy was, was a huge, huge thing. Uh, and so we're, I'm gonna go visit them for like a week. And then uh, there's a boat in New Zealand that I wanna see. And then there's a couple in Australia that I wanna see. Uh, whether or not we buy one of those site unseen and put a deposit down and, and get a survey done before the coronavirus thing is over, I don't know. Um, but we're right at this holding pattern point where now we have money for the deposit. We're ready to rock with that. We just have to wait until we can see the boat. Uh, I'm not going to buy anything I can't see. Um, let's see. I'm just going through to see this. Came in late. Where's Kim? Bob, uh, Kim is in Mexico. She's about to go to Berlin. Um, she's not going to be here today. Um, let's see. How far from your destination were you when the hole fracture occurred? Nathan Daniel, we were uh, 40 miles when the boat broke. And overnight, because the sea anchor didn't work, we drifted another 20 miles. So in like maybe, let's see, it happened at 4.30 till 6.30, 8.30 probably is when we got the engines running. Let's say 9.30, so five hours, we went 20 miles. We were doing four knots. Beam, beam on with just the winches to the boat. It shows you how much wind we were dealing with. And probably current too, because as you go, if you look up um, the windy in, in Hawaii, you can see that the big island makes a huge wind shadow. And right when we hit the southern end of that wind shadow, I think what we, we had was this like trifecta of wave refraction from swell and from wind waves, and then like a acceleration of the wind on that, like right next to that wind shadow because as soon as we got the engine started, we were in the shadow of this in like two hours. We almost made it. But anyway, we were 60 miles off at the, at the farthest point and 40 miles off when it happened. Uh, Gary Turgis says, uh, did you have any issues at Easter Island? I uh, heard some tourists are having problems with the locals. No, absolutely not. I, uh, we had a wonderful time there. We spent 34 days there. You're only allowed 30. They offered us an extension. Uh, we saw boats sail all the way there and stay for like three days and they didn't like the rolling so they just left which is another reason we're getting another catamaran so uh we had a wonderful time we made really good friends we had we made friends with the with the locals because both of us speak spanish so maybe that had something to do with it um we hitchhiked everywhere and we made friends that way it was just an awesome place we were friends with the, the fishermen because the wave would close out the harbor entrance and we couldn't get the port boat through there. So, uh, and then the port boat sank there too. And we woke up and it was just bobbing. And then I took the main halyard and I wrapped it around the engine and I undid the engine and I forgot to close the clutch on the main halyard and it just went down like 70 feet. And I was like, no, and it took the whole halyard with it. So I had to free dive down there, grab the halyard, get it back up there, get, put it on a winch, get the thing up. It was, it was underwater for like 10 minutes and it was just never the same. Uh, that, pretty much uh, killed that outboard until I could get parts in Tahiti, I think. I don't think we had an outboard for a long time. Okay, uh, what else? Did you have any issue? Oh, here we go. Did your Navy training help save the day? You know, Daniel, um, the Navy training definitely helped with me staying calm and using the radio. Uh, when I told the Coast Guard that I'm ex-Navy, they were like, ah, yeah, makes sense. Because I was talking to him at one, at one point I was talking to him and I was saying, look, this is my position, I'm just reporting you to my position. And then the boat broke again, the, the ropes parted. And I was like, uh, listen, I need to go. I'll be back in a second. I'm gonna take care of this. If you don't hear from me in half an hour, send someone. <laughs> and uh, I, I ended up getting back to him in about 15 minutes. And I said, look, I had to get back in the water and, and tie the boat up. Uh, and they were like, wow, you, you were making us calmer uh, just over the radio. So I guess I did something right. Maybe it was the Navy training. I, I, I have a lot of, um, experience on the radio okay uh, the sea anchor is a parachute yes that's right They're kind of like that uh, a sea anchor can also be um, like a, 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 a multiple things but the parachute works the best um, let's say I'm not gonna go over where Kim is again that's just a thing 
How long did your craziness on Zingaro 1 last? Outdoors family, what's up guys? Hi. Uh, the, the Zingaro was our boat for three years. Almost to the day. It was three years and 10 days. I left on December 12th, 2016 and the boat broke up on December 20, 2019. Um, and, you know, for the next boat, we're looking at something that's going to be um, complete composite, uh, preferably foam, and built really well. Uh, that's the most important thing because, you know, the plans are to go really far. Um, any good books on tutorials on Dyneema splicing? Well, I made three videos on Dyneema splicing. You can look at that. That's pretty much all the splices you're going to need. Just look up... Um, Dyneema on Google and I think mine is the first video that will pop up but if not the first then there's three videos in that series just like a Dyneema um, Zingaro okay are we good let's see if I if I've cut up hello from Kansas Donnie Porter what's up buddy is there anything salvageable from the boat hell yeah uh, the water maker I actually put the water maker into a bag we had three ditch bags one of them was the water maker and it weighed like 80 pounds and I was waiting to laugh with the, when I passed it to the Coast Guard, but uh, we didn't end up uh, ditching the boat, so that's good. But we had the water maker in a bag. So this is what I salvaged from the boat. The water maker, the autopilot, um, the in in entire linear drive autopilot, the uh, masthead light, uh, all of the kiteboarding gear, um, the spinnaker. I, I took the spinnaker. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, the spinnaker will come in handy as a small spinnaker on a bigger boat or uh, it'll handle like a 40-foot boat and that spinnaker cost me like 2200 bucks and it's in perfect condition so it's worth shipping it somewhere to the new boat so maybe if it comes with a spinnaker I'll have to a lot of people blow those out because they're really thin but they're really nice to have I really like flying a, a, a kite when I can uh, the VHF I did not uh, salvage just it's, old, it's older and it, I don't know maybe I'll go get it I'm still here um, uh, David Westwood, a lot of Shionings are homemade as well. Yeah, I know, and I'm not, I'm not going to buy a homemade one. Um, let's see. Okay, cool. Time to talk about drogues. So, uh, drogues are equally as important as to sea anchors, in my honest opinion, as long as you have the right mounting hardware. You need something like crazy stout. Like, I'd say a backing plate like this with a, with a cleat on the top or one of the winches or something. You need something that's not going to rip out of the boat because there's going to be tons of force on that. Uh, everything you look up is going to is going to say that. So let's talk about the drogues. So drogues, there's a lot of different kind of drogues. Uh, this is one. It's made by the same people that do uh, para anchor. It's called a sea claw. And the difference between the sea claw is it's made in a way where that, that bottom portion that's kind of rounded in the scoops will pull the sea claw underwater. So actually, I'm very interested in that. I'd like to get one of those and try it out. I think I'll call them and say, look, I want to try this this out and I want to give you a review on it and I want to tell people uh, which which works better. Um, this one is called a Gale Rider Drogue. Uh, this is basically just a big net with uh, webbing that will slow you down. This is made so the water will still go through it just slow you down It's not a sea anchor off the front of the boat It's a drogue off the back of the boat while you're running with the storm You'll have this big big freaking thing back in the back and it'll slow you down It'll, it'll keep you what it, what it does if you if you guys don't know is uh, What happens with a boat during a storm like this is? Uh, you'll, the, the waves start building higher and higher, and the boat ends up surfing down these waves. I'll do it this way. Uh, so this is the wave pattern, and it ends up surfing down the front of the waves, and it picks up the boat, and the boat just starts flying, especially a catamaran. I mean, you can see the fastest we got on Zingaro is 22 knots. That's freaking fast. And what will happen is uh, the boat will end up getting kind of out of control, and if it, if it turns and it's doing 20 knots, there's a really good chance that it'll trip on itself and it'll uh, it'll flip. Um, usually with a catamaran, that's not the case. What happens with the cat is, as soon as it gets to the bottom, they call it the trough of the wave. So you got the up, the upper part, the bottom part of the cosine, or the sine wave. Um, it hits the bottom and it hits the trough and it ends up burying the bows and uh, doing a flip move. 
So I've got a video on that actually. Let me see if I can access that of how that works. Yeah, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna show you guys that real quick. I don't know what's going on with the music on this thing. I'm not sure if you can still hear me. So I'm just gonna let you guys watch this. This is an, uh, this is a uh, pitch pole. So let me, let me see, just give me one sec, sorry. Desktop, window capture, transition, no, that didn't work. Well, it didn't work, huh? Oh, that's why. Just give me a sec. There we go. Okay, so these are these guys are just rolling along, rolling along, rolling along. They're they're sailing pretty fast. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. So you can see that the the thing's overpowered a little bit, and it's starting to bury the hull. Uh, the leeward hull, that's the one on the right, buries it too much and it flips. Now you can imagine doing that on a 40-foot uh, boat. I mean, that was like a 25-foot little Hobie Cat looking thing. If you do it on a cruising boat, you're, you're done. That's game over. Now, there's no way to get it flipped back over. People have come up with all kinds of different ways, but without, it, without another power boat to like have a bridle underneath it and pull it up, you're not getting up again. Um, and you could be killed. I mean, you slammed in, into bulkheads, break their ribs, break their neck, uh, flown off the boat, <coughs> very easily drowned. That's scary. So that's what happens. So this is why you need a drogue. So this is the Gale Rider drogue. Uh, this is kind of the drawing of what it looks like when it's um, set up. Uh, this is Okay, now we come to the Jordan Series Drogue. This is the Jordan Series Drogue. Um, it's basically a line with like 150 cones and each little cone provides its own drag. And that way if one collapses or a bunch collapse, you still have some drag. If, if some pop out of the water, you still have some drag in the water. Uh, I like the design and it's been proven to be one of the better designs. I have never, I don't have any experience with this type of drogue. Uh, I was using an anchor for my drogue and for the other drogue it was just a loop uh, which that was suggested by another cruiser and I tried it and it worked uh, but I needed like three more and all I had was two, 400 feet of line. Um, the Jordan series drogue uh, when you flake it out on deck it kind of looks like this and um, this is what it looks like when you winch it up. This is the cool part about the Jordan series drogue is you can put it on a winch and the cones will collapse and you can get it back in and you can adjust the the um, drag that it provides. Um, you, these things cost about $1,500. So they're a bit of an investment, but uh, like I said, I will never go to sea without a, a real drogue. Um, you can make your own or have your own made. This is a really good picture. Um, the, this is from my buddy's cell phone. Uh, he had looked into Ace Sailmakers making this for him. And what you're looking at is a Dyneema drogue. And they make the cones all the way on the far right. Uh, they make the cones like that, and then they just stick them through and tie a knot uh, through the Dyneema. And then the dy Dyneema already has a bridle on it. Uh, you would not want to get this caught in anything, <laughs> but that's how it works. And then if you see the picture on the top right, uh, that is a little sleeve that they put the chain in. They can, um, they can have a weight on it right right as the um, right on the end so very cool system that's from ace sailmakers uh, i'll look into how much those cost i think he said about a grand so it's a little less than the actual jordan series drug from jordan series drone uh, that's a patented thing i think well it must not be because this they're able to sell these ones not sure if it's good to have it out of dyneema but if if you're talking about 200 feet of drone of um, drogue and and that's three eighths dyneema I mean, I bought a roll and it was $2 a foot. So you're talking about uh, $400 in Dyneema right there. So if they charge a thousand for the whole thing, I think that's a pretty good deal. And it's already done and set and ready to rock and probably proven uh, they've, they've got a couple of testimonials on their website. Anyway, that's Ace uh, Sailmakers, they, they make that. Cool?
Okay, let's go back to the uh, YouTubes and, oh, what are we doing here? No, what the hell? Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> I'm still watching YouTubes on the other channel. Okay, cool. Um, I've never heard or seen of this. I feel so out of place here. Uh, yeah, well, that's why I'm going over this so you guys can have an idea of what the difference is between a drogue and, and a sea anchor and how this works for uh, heavy weather sailing. Uh, if you sail or you have dreams of sailing, you're gonna get into heavy, heavy weather. There is just no two, two ways about it. Unless you completely have all the time in the world and decide that you're not ever gonna go out when the weather's shitty which means that you can't take a passage over seven days because they can't predict weather that's that's real uh, accurate over seven days uh, so that means you can't go on more than a thousand mile journey which kind of limits you to everywhere but the pacific uh you know basically you're going to get caught in weather and you need to know what to do and this is two really good things and things that i learned that uh would would have mitigated a little bit more and maybe saved a, you know could have cost us uh our lives really okay let's see when do you use one or the other Daniel says um, the okay let's let's talk about that. that that was the next thing on the on the outline to talk about so we've talked about uh, series uh, drogues we've talked about standing drogues we've talked about sea anchors let's talk about seamanship and heavy seas because now you need to know when to use them right so as soon as the wind picks up, say it goes from zero to 40 in like 10 minutes and you, you get all the sails down and you're, you're running either on bare poles or just with a little bit of sail up and you can't really beat against 40 knots of wind. It just doesn't work and it's very uncomfortable and it's very hard on the boat. So what you do is if you have enough sea room, you know, there's no islands in the way or land in the way, you just turn and run and it's called running with the storm. You just go with the wind and that brings down the apparent wind uh, uh, strength because if you're running at 10 knots and the, and the wind's blowing 40 knots you know you're actually only feeling 30 knots on the boat now it makes it way more comfortable but the problem is the boat's going super fast and depending on how big the waves are now you're getting the waves to kind of uh, surf the boat too so you could be pushing 16 17 18 knots on a cat uh, even on a monohull on a big monohull you can do that and it's scary and it comes to a point where you know you you, you're not going to be out there with zero sailing experience. So you've, you've taken a couple of hundred mile journeys and stuff. You know what the boat's supposed to feel like. If it starts shuddering as it's like surfing down the waves and, and you're losing control of the wheel, bad. So that, that's, that's the time where you put the drogue out. That's the, that's the series drogue or the gale rider drogue where it's, or, or a tire or an anchor with two or 300 feet of line that's just going to slow your ass down. Uh, anchors and tires don't work as well as, as those other drogues. There's plenty, plenty, plenty to read on the internet about this. Uh, the next thing you can do is if you're going too fast or if the wind's too strong or if you just cannot sail anymore, you can you can turn around and you can put a sea anchor out. Uh, that's for like, uh, I, I met a guy in uh, Fanning Island that went through a hurricane in the Atlantic, uh, in the Northern Atlantic. Uh, he said it was like 140 mile an hour winds and he was on a sea anchor. Uh, lots of chafing protection and he said for two days, him and his family of nine, they had seven kids and a dog on their boat, uh, on a big steel boat. And the only thing that, that, that happened with him is his solar panels blew off the boat. Um, I don't know whether he took his sails in, I don't know whether he tried to reduce the windage on his boat. He didn't have a dodger on his boat, so that probably made a, a bit of a difference. And he had a big steel boat. But he said the seas were like 50, 60 feet, and the winds got up to 140 miles an hour. And he was able to survive because he had this anchor. And they just went down, downstairs and rode it out. So scary and crazy and totally fine afterwards, still cruising. So uh, that's what you do in, in case the, you know, if you get to a point where the drogue's not working enough, or what'll happen is the, the waves will get so big that they start to crest. So you'll start to get hit in the back by these waves and you'll just be dumping, dumping thousands of tons of, of, of water on your boat and just messing up your whole day. If that's happening to you, you turn around so they're now dumping on the front of your boat and just crashing and, and going backwards. Uh, you know, it, it comes with its own set of, of risks now. If you have any forward facing windows, those are now at, at risk to get blown out by a wave. Uh, but that's, that's another one. 
Um, and then ultimately with a mono hull, you can do what's called uh, lying a hull or heaving two. And that's basically where you backwind the jib. So normally on a sailboat, let me see how this looks. So it's the easiest way for me to explain how this works. Oh shit, what happened? Okay. Let me know if this is still working for you guys. I think the internet's getting a little funny. Um, I'm just gonna wait for one minute until the internet comes back. Yeah, we'll put this outside. Hmm. Okay, I think we're good. I think we're back. Um, sorry, but uh, the internet here, I'm, I'm going over a phone. Uh, I'm in the harbor, there's no harbor internet, and it's pretty crappy. So let's just see if we're back here. Shit. Um, I'm just gonna keep going because it, it sounds like the sound is fine. Can you guys let me know? Um, yeah. Hey, Tula's in the Summers here. What's up, Billy and Sierra? I love you guys, dude. How would you winch uh, in a Dyneema line drogue? Guys, that was my question. So, uh, yeah, you, you would have to have two people. So you could put three or four wraps around the winch, but you can't put it in the self-tailor. It'll just slip out of that. So you'd have to have somebody pulling on the, on the Dyneema rope while you had it in the winch. Damn it. This is not working. Hey, can you guys let me know if it, it sounds good? Okay, good. Uh, and Jetty, don't forget Jetty. Yeah, 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 they're puppy Jetty. Good to see you guys. Uh, will Zingaro 2 be able to reach 22 knots also? Yeah, probably. Um, I don't know what I don't know what's going to be the, the ultimate boat, but it's going to be bigger and stronger than Zingaro 1. Uh, so where was I? Let's go back to the thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, so lying a hull is where you uh, back wind of the jib and then put the main all the way over to the other side, the same side as the, the jib is back winded, and then uh, you, you put the rudder all the, all the way over to the other side. So what, what happens essentially is the wind catch, catches your jib, throws you off, catches the main, throws you up, and then you go into the wind, but the, but the boat doesn't have enough momentum to get through the wind, so you just kind of fall off, and you end up doing this like back and forth thing and kind of crabbing your way sideways that's the true real direction you're going uh and not really moving and it works really well on a monohull boat not so good on a on a multi-hole i've tried it many times uh, what happens on a multi-hole is uh, it's really hard to get the sa the main sail to a point where the boat won't just flip around jibe fill the fill the jib and then just keep going in circles so you end up just doing circles where you jibe and then you backwind and then you jibe and then you go the back the other way and then you jibe it's it's just kind of a shit show. So <clears throat> I haven't really been able to do it on Zingaro, but that was a light catamaran. Uh, something like this boat, maybe. Um, Brian, can you can you lie a hull in this boat? Can you heave two? No. No? no. Yeah, he it says no. Yeah, so it, it doesn't really uh, work in cats. At least two <laughs> in, in this experience. Let's see if we're back. Oh, man. Uh, I don't have any um, video going on mine. So, let's see. Oh, now it's, ha now it's happening. Uh, James, thank you so much for the $20, man. Appreciate that. You're the man. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, Big Ocean Small Boat says, we, we heave two under storm jib and no main. Are you guys on a catamaran? Uh, because, uh, or, or are, are you on a monohull? Art, thanks, bro. Really appreciate it. Uh, does that mean, Joseph Cross says, does that mean monoholes are better in weather? No, not at all. It just means they heave too better in weather. Um, Multi-holes, you can, you can surf a lot easier, and they're a lot safer when you're running with a storm. Uh, monohole, once, it, once, it, once a monohole goes above hull speed, it starts to get squirrely, and it's much easier to broach, uh, in, in my opinion and, and from my experience. Um, maybe I can... You'd have to do your own research on that one. It's, it's tough. But in my experience, catamarans are better because they, 
you can run with a storm a lot faster and get away and run from a storm a lot faster and potentially get out of the way of a storm uh, instead of just having to bash into it because your boat's too slow to get away from it. Um, I felt, I, I personally have been on Zingaro surfing down waves at 16 knots in 40 knots of wind and it felt great, it felt fine. Uh, we took all of the sails down and we were still doing like eight knots on bare poles and it felt great. Uh, I didn't have any problem with it. And as a matter of fact, we loved it because we got to the next island right at sunset and that would have been impossible on a, on a multi-hole boat and we're able to hide behind the island and not have to go out to sea for three days. So Paul Jones says, what is hull speed? Hull speed is the theoretical maximum speed for your boat. There is a formula for this. Uh, it's water line length times, I don't know, 1 the square root of water line times 1.4, something like that. Um, I can look it up for you if you'd like, but uh, there, is, there is an actual hull speed that's the theoretical maximum hull speed for a, a displacement monohull boat. Uh, that, that doesn't quite work on a, on a catamaran because once you start planing on a cat, it, it, it changes that. A monohull doesn't plane. Get it? Um, Sail Aurea says, I'm not going to be in any kind of hurry. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Monohull boats are, are they're, man, I don't know if I want to make blanket statements like that, but it's just a little bit more comfortable if you're going through uh, heavy weather on a monohull and it gets like out of control heavy because you can just put a parachute anchor out and the boat's shaped like a teardrop so any big breaking waves will just come over the boat and you'll probably be fine on a cat it gets to a point where you know if you have to cut and run it it, it can get really fast and really scary and really dangerous so yeah um, James Humer says, I told my wife about your 10 days and she and I know I'm due. Yeah, dude, come out. Um, let's see. Big ocean, small boat, 33 foot, 1970s, fin keel, monohull. Yeah, yeah. Your boat would definitely lie a hole better than mine. Uh, or heave to, is what it's called. Let's see. Um, okay. Cool, let's, go, let's move on. I'm going to... Ah, Israel, thanks for five bucks, bro. Uh, yes, we are going to buy a Shioning, or uh, maybe we've got our eyes on a, um, a couple custom boat built catamarans too. Uh, all very good construction, and yeah, most of the Shioning boats are made out of balsa, and I'd really like to get away from a wood core boat, but it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to. I don't know. We'll see. I'll go, I'll go over that with all of the patrons next week and the Kickstarter backers, uh, so watch for that. Okay. Let's, let's move on. Now, um, I want to talk about uh, setting up the boat for heavy weather. So, do you guys know what a trisail is? That is a very small sail that's like a storm main. It's, it, it's like a triangle that goes right in the crutch of your uh, mast and boom. And sometimes you can have another track for it. Uh, that would be a good idea to have on, uh, on, a, on a boat. Or, if you had some kind of like in boom furling system where you could have just a little bit of sail up. Uh, so, I'm, on a catamaran, the reason that we were uh, without an engine was because the main uh, in its third reef was not cut right to the boat and it was way too big. We were going at 12, 13 knots in upwind in 35 knots of wind and it, I had to put, take the entire main down, which meant that the boat was entirely being driven by the foresail, which meant it was falling off to leeward. The wind's going this way, the leeward is the other side of the boat. So wind's coming this way, I'm going this way, and the boat wants to go that way. But I want the boat to go straight. So that means that the, the um, autopilot is constantly fighting the boat, like fighting, fighting. Because on the very front of the boat, you've got wind pushing you this way. On the very back of the boat, you've got your rudders pushing the water and trying to push you this way. Uh, not a good thing, and it drained the batteries. Every night it would drain the batteries, and then the, the solar would charge them up again. Um, consequently, the autopilot that we were using, the Raymarine Linear Drive Autopilot, worked until about 10.4 volts on the batteries, which is freaking amazing that, that it can still drive the uh, linear drive. Uh, thank you, Raymarine, for making something that is, is so good. I would definitely recommend that. Um, that's the one we're about to replace in the series because you, you guys know my autopilot went out 500 miles into my journey to Easter Island. and. We were able to put bungees on the boat and kind of balance it with the sails. We didn't hand steer until we were about 100 miles away. 
um, and we didn't have to hand steer the whole time. <clears throat> but had we had a linear drive autopilot, that wouldn't have been an issue. Point being, to wrap up that thought, is uh, if you don't have a little main on a catamaran, you can't balance the, the boat very well. Balance, trying to balance the boat with just the foresail, or, or if you have a staysail, is ludicrous. It's not going to work. Um, in, in the future, I will have some kind of thing I can put there, like a trisail, to have a little bit of main, or maybe a fourth reef, or maybe a roller furling in boom system, or, or something that I can have just a little tiny bit of sail up and still make way under sail controlled fashion, but the boat will be balanced and now um, the, the force of effort will come from the center of the boat instead of the front. Okay. That was a long diatribe about that. Joe Breezy, what's up, man? Thanks, brother. We really appreciate that. I think I'm out. This stuff is all over my head. Happy to see your face again. Joe, really appreciate that, brother. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, if you if you rewatch this, maybe you'll get some ideas on what you can do and my thoughts about um, storm sailing. Okay, let's talk about a reefable jib. I do have a picture of that. Um, the, so roller furlers came on the market years and years and years ago and um, all the time that they were up if you wanted to reef your your jib you would end up like like curling it up and then it would and then it would blow out and then it would distort the sail so what they did to mitigate that was they would put foam luff tape uh, in in the front along the um, here I got a picture boom so you see the optional foam luff here? That is foam luff tape, and it's usually more than one, that uh, extends the width of the um, track and makes the sail have a better shape. So it's not perfect, it's definitely not perfect, but it does save your sail a little bit and it makes it have a bit, it, a bit better shape so you can still uh, beat. The problem is, uh, once you start reefing it onto that furler, it puts a lot of load on the furler and it en ends up breaking the track pins, it breaks the, the drum, uh, at least it did on the Harkin Cruising Mark II that we had. Um, so I would definitely recommend if you're going to have one sail, uh, one four sail, and not like a, a, a system to replace them with smaller and smaller sails that you have something with foam luff tape that can be reefed. Uh, that came in handy. Although a lot of the time we would reef it down so much that the tape didn't even matter anymore. And at that point, you really just need a storm sail. So I don't have a good um, answer for that one, but I wanted to talk about that, that um, reefable jib. Uh, a life raft, that is a um, personal preference, whether you want a life raft or not. If, you have, if you're on a catamaran and the catamaran doesn't sink and you, and you have an inversion plan where, okay, I've already put mounts in the bottom of the boat and if it's inverted, I'll, I'll hang a hammock to keep me out of, the, out of the wind and waves, then maybe you can get away with no, um, no life raft. If you have an unsinkable dinghy and you have an enclosure for it, maybe you can get away with no life raft. Or if you're really, really anal, uh, we, you can just carry around your own life raft even when you cruise with other people. So, that's all personal preference. Uh, there's no real right answer. Uh, you can be completely crazy, overly safe, and have everything. Or if you don't have the money for it, maybe maybe you can't. Um, I will say that having a ditch bag is a really good idea. Radio, we had a solar charging battery and a, a cord for the radio just in case we were out there for multiple days. Uh, you can radio aircraft from VHF. They monitor the, air, the VHF bands. And you can obviously uh, radio other boats. That's probably one of your best bets. Um, and it's really easy these days because they sell those solar, solar uh, it's basically a solar panel with a battery behind it with a USB. And they make waterproof ones. Uh, you can put it in a waterproof bag. That's what we did both on both counts. And then have a cable that goes to your waterproof radio. And now you have a way to power the radio for weeks. And you can get a hold of people a lot easier that way than trying to fire off flares. People just aren't looking for that. It, it's just hard to look out all the time, even on sailboats. Um, you're just not looking in all directions all the time. I mean, if, if we went by somebody on a life raft and they fired a flare, I can guarantee you we wouldn't see it. Um, almost all the time. Um, it's just the way it is. So VHF, much better. Uh, you can have a spear gun. You can have a small little spear gun. That's what we had. A solar still, so you can make water out of the seawater uh, by evaporating it into a cup. 
and then whatever else you want, you know, water and, and provisions and however, much, however big you want to make it, medical supplies. But those are my suggestions to you on what to put in your, in your ditch bag. And you can get all that stuff for like 250 bucks, maybe 300 bucks. So um, maybe 400 bucks, but it, it's worth it. Your EPIRB is not the be all end all to, um, to surviving a catastrophe like this. Okay, last thing I'm gonna talk about, and then we'll get to questions from the patrons, is boat maintenance. So I get a lot of crap on YouTube for um, my, the way my boat looks and everybody thinks that it's not maintained, but actually it is maintained. I just don't do all the, all the cosmetic stuff. Um, uh, on this passage, I will be honest with you, and we had some pretty major leaks. Uh, one of the chain plates was leaking on the port side, which is not the side that leaked, that broke. Um, and I tried, to f I tried to fill that multiple times and what it ended up be being was a crack in the fiberglass next to the chain plate. It wasn't actually the chain plate, but what happens is when you're sailing, those chain plates are moving just a little bit if they're not carbon, like like spreading the load out. Uh, if they're just regular chain plates, they're going in through the deck and they're going into a hull. And there's like four boats that are the entire load. So when it's shock loading and when you're taking big big uh, uh, waves and stuff, you you're you're moving that thing. And what you need is some kind of um, the best thing to use for chain plates is a piece of G10 like this, and you cut a slot in it, and then you just fill that whole G10 with um, butyl tape, and then you screw it down to the deck, and it squeezes all that all that butyl tape in there. Butyl tape stays uh, flexible even in the sun, and that was the ultimate fix for Zingaro. Um, unfortunately, I never did it. I had the, the, the plates, but um, didn't want to take the rig apart again because I had it tuned perfectly, and it made the water come in on that side. It wasn't pouring in, but it was enough to get our bed wet, and it was sh it was just shitty. It was it, having water come in on a passage like that is just not good. Um, let's see. Um, there was a couple broken blocks that ended up ripping out one of the stanchions. We were we were running with the spinnaker, and uh, the block exploded, and then the spinnaker spinnaker clue grabbed a, a stanchion and then just ripped that stanchion right out of the boat. So, yeah, that sucks. Um, that just happens. And then, yeah, so, oh, leaky hatches. So I have a, a boat hacks vid that I go over how to make your hatches not leak. I've seen this problem on nearly every single boat I've ever been on um, for more than a day where their hatches leak and there's no reason to let your um, hatches leak. So if you guys would like to watch that video, I'm gonna put a link in here. That's the link for the video. And we, you can um, check it out and see what I did to stop my hatchers from leaking. It's a constant problem. You, you constantly have to rebed the, the frames and uh, hatches are really expensive. So a lot of people just don't, they just let them go and they're like, oh, I'll just replace them. But you don't have to. You can use some AC ducting or some closed cell foam, uh, just glue it on there and then put some new, like pop the window out of it and put all new adhesive to get the window in there. Okay, that's it for the lessons learned. Now, let's go to questions that some people have sent me. Um, let's see. Where are they? Where are they? Okay, Joel, uh, one of my patrons said, would having enough crew 24 seven helm watch have improved the situation? Uh, no, I don't think so. It wasn't really about having a helm watch. It was at night and uh, I think that the only thing that would have improved the situation in that respect was was to turn off even more and run or to put the sea anchor out prematurely when, when those big waves came. But literally like when we got into that, that um, piece of uh, the really tumultuous waves, it was like two waves and the second one broke us. So the, we'd been running like that for three or four days. It'd been a 10 day trip from um, Fanning to Hawaii. We were on the last day and but for the last three or four days, it had been rough. It had been 30, 30 knots. It had been you know, like beating into bullshit, but this was just like the, the, the ultimate, um, what is it called the, uh, in a book, the climax to the trip. So, I mean, one wave hit us, boom! And we both looked at each other like, 
oh boy, we better run off. And by the time I got to the wheel, another wave hit us and just cracked us. And, and uh, that's pretty much it. There was nothing really we could have done with more crew. More crew would have helped with getting in the water though. Okay, Albert says, what type of auto autopilot do you prefer? I went over that already. I, I prefer a linear drive or a hydraulic drive any day. The linear drive never gave us any problems. It was completely silent and there was no wheel drive on the wheel. Uh, the wheels give us nothing but problems. That was uh, something that I should have invested in while we were um, uh, investing in things to cross the Pacific, but I only had a limited amount of money and we needed solar panels, we needed a force day, we needed some things that were more important than the autopilot that was working. Uh, in retrospect, that was a stupid move. Um, Sa Sailing Santa says, is it, is it possible to heave to? Oh, I went over that already, cool. Rainer says, did you see any signs of construction fatigue beforehand? Yes, of course. I mean, there was, there was cracks and we had one of the stringers break that had gotten some water intrusion in it uh, maybe a year before that. And yes, uh, yeah, there was. Uh, there was not any signs of fatigue on the main beam. There wasn't any signs of water intrusion. And if you watched my video where I went through the boat and tore everything apart, there really wasn't any water intrusion on that side on the main beams. Uh, the water was more into the glue of the, of the, of the wood and into the wood, into the plywood. So <laughs> ultimately it ended up being a problem where the plywood was so old that it, it just didn't really, couldn't take the, the impact. And then on the, on the rear main beam, it looked like he modified the original plans and put like a crutch instead of the beam. So the beam, this is the outside of the boat, the beam went all the way across. He ended up cutting it and opening up the, the access to the hull and then stopping that beam here and then having another beam that kind of went down like this. So it looked like kind of like that, and then there was the access to the engine room. Bad idea, dude. Um, you, you just completely screwed up the whole uh, structural integrity of the boat. I didn't know that. I didn't um, look at the plans like that closely. I didn't notice it until somebody had pointed it out that was a um, Crowther enthusiast. Okay. Did you ever, did you take on any water and fear sinking at any time during the disaster? And what was your plan then? Uh, we had the OC tender, thank God. <clears throat> if you guys want to see what the OC tender is, there's 600 of you watching right now, so yeah, I'd like to show you. Um, this is the boat that we have now. It is an awesome boat. Um, I, I actually love it. I think it's the best, best dinghy ever made. You're going to start seeing some more videos with this. We've just been waiting to get to the point where we have one of those. That way it makes sense. But um, this is not the OC tender. And this is a bad, bad, bad boat. Uh, we had the 30, the 300. Um, that's the owner in the boat. So this is the 300. It, it, it fits. Um, we were able to plane with me and Kimmy all the time with two people and a uh, and a eight horse motor. But you can plane with three people sometimes, and it's three meters, so it's 12 feet. And inside the gunnels. Uh, there, there's nothing inside so you can if you look in this picture you can see up underneath there's little hanging bags and they're just these these dinghies are badass they're, they're for everything they're for fishing spear fishing uh, lots of people we had like seven people in it they're they're bad dinghies get ready to see more of these out on the market because they're taking over guarantee you're gonna see a, a shitload of these whenever uh, a, a major dinghy company buys their company and starts just distributing distributing them uh, a little bit easier okay back to the questions uh, did the dyneema rig have anything to do with this oh good question so the dyneema rig is attached with the side shrouds and the inter intermediate shrouds inboard of the hulls that didn't have anything to do with that side the only one was the backstay i did have the rig pretty tight but uh, through doing that rig twice and just dealing with the Dyneema rig and having attention at all, all the time, I know w what I'm doing with that. And it was more, I don't think that the extra tight tension on the rig caused this problem. I think it was just uh, structural weakness and um, maybe a little bit of, it could have been the, the water intrusion into the glue of the foam. Uh, it was the shape of the bottom profile of the wing deck to bridge joint, you know, underneath the boat. Like here's the catamaran, here's the top of it. This, that joint right there, this joint, um, it was just like a 90 degree. Whereas now you see catamarans and they're more like this. Um, so whoever fixes the boat, I was telling them, you know, take a tube and put it there and like fare that in. So it's, 
uh, it's got a little bit more of a of an ang of a um, what is it called a ang uh, yeah an angle a curve there. Okay, um, thoughts on catamarans now that one almost killed you, <laughs> and are you going to get a monohull? That's the big question, huh? I I still love being on a cat. I'm I'm going to still cruise on a cat, and I. Uh, don't have any problem with monohulls. I've had a bunch of monohulls. This is going to be my fifth boat. Um, I've, I've had four monohulls before. Oh, no, three monohulls and, and a cat. And I just, for the cruising, for the style of cruising that we do, like if you don't know us, we are, we go everywhere. We don't care. We'll, we'll go to, we'll beat to the nether regions of anywhere just to see something that we want to see. And I like cruising like that, and I can only do that on a cat because, I mean, if you go into an island that's very small and it's got wrap around for the current and the wind's coming from over here and the surf's right here and you're tied to a rock, you want to be on a catamaran. You're just not going to be uh, comfortable rolling around all night. Um, you can handle a lot more and you can sleep a lot more out on anchor or on a mooring when you're on a cat, and that makes a huge difference. I, I will deal with the problems beating. It doesn't beat as well. It doesn't... Uh, you know, there's there's other there's a there's always a trade-off, but I like being on a cat. Plus, I like to go fast and I like to sail. So that's it. All right, I'm finally done speaking. What? How long have we been doing this now? Um, it says I don't know. Who cares? Um, I'm gonna go through your guys' uh, 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 notes now and see if there's any other questions that I haven't gone over already. In hind Israel said, in hindsight, is there any way you could have prevented the boat failure? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think if I would have turned off or put the pair anchor out before getting to that point and just waited, then yes. But the problem is I would have maybe missed Hawaii and had to, I didn't have much fuel to get back. So it was really like a basis of, okay, we're almost there. We're almost in the lead. We're 40 miles away. Let's just, let's just suck it up and go. Um, did we have an EPIRB onboard lifestyle asks? Yes, we did. We never popped it. Um, I'm not saying that because I'm proud of it. I'm just saying that, that that's that's what happened. We were able to call the Coast Guard via VHF, and um, luckily that that was how that worked. I don't know how if we would have popped it or not, uh, to tell you the truth. We would have probably had to sail. Had we been like 100 miles out, we would have had to put, put the sails up with the boat tied together, and that would have been scary. So maybe, I don't know. Uh, Outdoors Family says G10. G10 is this uh, really, really compressed fiberglass plastic material. Really, really strong. Um, let's see. Joe Burris says James and Kimmy rock. Um, Ivana says ETA on the new boat. I don't know. which depends on the, the coronavirus. As soon as borders open up with New Zealand, then you'll start seeing stuff from uh, Zingaro's new boats. Uh, Pure Witsy says Hobby. Vivin XNX says, hey, you James, superstars, both of you did what many would say is impossible. Oh, that's cool. I don't know about impossible, but it was definitely harrowing. Um, Ivana says, hey, James, where are you now and where is Zingaro? Zingaro has been sold. Um, it's sitting up on the hard a mile from me. I visit it sometimes just to get nostalgic. And uh, it's sold to a bud that's going to rebuild it or maybe put it into charter or maybe make it into an ohana here in hawaii which is like a guest house which would be cool um yeah it, it, it was a, i needed to move on it was one of those things where after i sold the boat and I'm, I'm i'm being a little vulnerable with you guys right now on the plane i, I sold the boat like 30 minutes before i took a plane to go to my vipassana um course and i was crying like a baby because i was just i didn't realize how much trauma i was associating with that boat and how much of a weight it had lifted by selling it. So um, I've moved on. Um, I got barely any money for it, and that's fine. I, I really wanted to uh, try to give it away, but that didn't work out. It was just too much liability and problems, and um, I just ended up finding somebody to buy it for cheap that I could say, look, you know, I'm giving you my home and everything with it, and all the tools and all the sales and everything, and uh, except for the spinnaker, and you know, good luck. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, Chris Corum says, have, have you looked at the Maverick 400? Yeah, those are really expensive. I'm not looking at um, a half million dollar boat. Um, how about build a kit boat? Yeah, I thought about that, but um, we want to get back on the water. So I'm going to 
buy a boat, a used boat. I'm not going to build one right now. Uh, plus, we sold some um, cruising experiences uh, through the Kickstarter. So we've got five people coming down for a week this year. So we need to get a boat. We need to keep going. Uh, the make, makes the most sense to me that we buy something and we just keep making this content instead of switching it to a uh, build channel, which is something that I would like to do someday in the future. But and actually right now they're huge, like like people that are building boats. That's what people are interested in because you can learn something. But I think that um, we're going to do a lot more uh, how to like walkthroughs. This is what I think about this. I'm going to go over a lot of different boats in the future once we catch up and say, look, this is what I'm looking at. This is how this is why just just be patient. I need to get all the, uh, the old content out so I can catch up. And this coronavirus works perfectly for me because uh, I can catch up and then get you guys on the same page as I am and then start making more. OK, look, this is what I'm up to now. Um, and we're doing some cool stuff, but we, we're really stuck right now. So um, Yora Media says, where did you go for Vipassana? I went to the Big Island. It was beautiful. Definitely recommend it. Anybody that hasn't heard of it, uh, it's called, it's look it up online. Google Vipassana, V-I-P-A-S-S-A-N-A. -S -S -A -A. It was a beautiful experience. OK, I'm done. I'm not talking anymore. I'm actually kind of sick of talking. Really, really cool hanging out with you guys. Uh, there was like 600 of you here, which is super neat. Um, I would suggest if you're a sailor and you don't have much offshore experience, rewatch this video and try to get an idea of what, uh, maybe do some research on drag devices and para anchors. Oh, there's a really good website called the Drag Device Database. I totally forgot to mention. Um, I'm gonna show it to you real quick. Boom, boom. This is the Drag Device Database. It is. Uh, the best resource for uh, real life um, uh, case histories of people that have been through things, uh, through heavy weather on catamarans, on multi hulls, on mono hulls, on trimarans, uh, both on drogues and sea anchors. Okay, so if you, we just go drogues on catamarans, uh, we can pull up. Look, there's a there's a DC one, DC two, DC three. There's a Prout, there's a Crowther in here. Uh, there's a Shutterworth. Like, look, this is from a Crowther. So like I had a Crowther, I'm looking at a, another Crowther, what they used, how it went. And it's a, it's case reports written by the owners and what exactly happened with these things. Uh, this one's actually really interesting. They ended up getting three of these different little sea squid devices and helping them kind of uh, make this device. So they, they scrapped two of them. Uh, but anyway, Drag Device Database is a really good resource. Uh, much love to everybody. Thank you for the donations. Really appreciate that. I hope that this shed lights, sheds light on a little bit of the uh, lessons learned for me. Uh, till next time. Next time you hear from me, um, maybe uh, it'll be about a boat. <laughs> okay. Talk to you later. Peace.